When I first started my channel, I never anticipated it to ever take off. However, since it has, a growing concern of mine is keeping my personal and private information both safe and secure. The fact that everyone who uses the internet is a potential victim, and even more so if you have a following, is a scary thing to worry about. I am constantly checking things relating to my channel through email, various social medias, and with the amount that goes into all of it, having something that both protects me and helps keep me efficient is a lifesaver. And Dashlane does both. It not only stores all of my payment information, passwords, and other personal details in a secure place that only I can access, but it also gives me peace of mind knowing that it is protected by secure technology that only I have access to, and nobody else, not even Dashlane, can access my information. And when it comes to being efficient, Dashlane truly helps me save time by autofilling my passwords with the click of a mouse, remembering my payment methods, and even provides a VPN for streaming content and secure browsing. If you find this as helpful as I do, my viewers can give Dashlane a try for free on their first device at www.dashlane.com forward slash cadaver. And if you decide to upgrade to premium, you can use my promo code cadaver to get 50% off premium. Now, on to the video. On Christmas Eve in 1975, a small aircraft would depart from the Glenforsa airfield on the Isle of Mull in Scotland. Piloting the Cessna F-150H was Peter Gibbs, a seasoned pilot and Royal Air Force veteran with over 10 years of flying experience to his name. And on this cold and snowy night of December 24th, 1975, Peter Gibbs would take off into the night sky and vanish without a trace. What followed would become one of aviation's greatest mysteries, and even today, over four decades later, answers to what happened to both Peter Gibbs and his plane remain shrouded in the unknown. This is the story of the Mole Air Mystery. As the hours counted down to Christmas Day on the Isle of Mole at the Forsa Hotel, Peter Gibbs and his girlfriend Felicity Granger were enjoying the warmth and comfort of the hotel's dining area as they finished off their dinner with several glasses of wine. It was then when Felicity would recount that Peter got the sudden urge to fly. Being an experienced veteran of flying, this feeling was nothing new, but being that it was not only calling for poor weather, but the moonless night on top of that made conditions risky even for the most seasoned pilots. This didn't dissuade Peter, however, even after several of the hotel staff argued against it, saying it was far too dangerous, and while sure, the hotel did have an airstrip close by, it had no lights and would make landing close to impossible. Peter, however, was quoted as telling the manager of the hotel, I am not asking for permission, I just thought it was courtesy to let you know, and I don't want to fuss. Around 9.30 p.m., Peter and Felicity made their way to the airstrip at the Glenforsa airfield. Peter gave Felicity a flashlight and made his way to a plane that he was borrowing at the time. It was a Cessna F-150H with a red and white paint scheme. As the engine roared to life, Felicity made her way to the edge of the airstrip and began directing Peter where to go. Within 15 minutes of this, Peter Gibbs was taking off from the runway and would soon seemingly vanish without a trace. Those who were there that night and witnessed the flight claimed it was a smooth takeoff, and even a few others commented on the skill level Peter had, even when flying at night with no moonlight. At the time, things seemed fine, and while I can't imagine that Felicity Granger watched Peter disappear over the tree line with both concern and excitement, those feelings would soon be replaced by panic and dread. 
By 10 p.m., Peter had still not returned. Felicity's worry grew by the minute, especially when the weather took a turn for the worst as it began to snow. By 10.10, Felicity's panic drove her to running back to the hotel to inform the staff that Peter had failed to return. And with the worsening weather, she was fearful of his safety. Staff at the hotel contacted the police and once they arrived, an investigation into the airfield began. At the same time, a search team was getting ready to take flight as well to begin looking for a possible wreckage. But most at the time had assumed that Peter had simply lost his direction and couldn't find the hotel due to the snow. By 10.45 p.m., Peter had now been missing for a full hour and police had finished their investigation into the airfield and saw nothing that appeared to be suspicious. The search team was also called off due to the weather becoming even worse and all anyone could do for the remainder of the night was wait until the morning and hope that either Peter had returned or a full search and investigation could begin. The following day, what should have been a day of celebration, as it was Christmas Day, was instead spent with police surrounding the hotel in search of the missing pilot. All of those who were guests at the hotel were questioned. Felicity was asked to retell her story from the start and go over every single detail. It was from this that investigators learned that when Peter got into the plane, he did two things that appeared odd. The first was that he let his plane idle for what was quoted as a noticeably long time, around 10 minutes. And he also turned his lights on, then back off, keeping them off for around 5 seconds, and then turned them back on once again. After this, with the help of Felicity guiding him, he went about a regular takeoff and seemingly vanished off the face of the earth. The search team was also simultaneously searching via plane for any sign of wreckage. They took the same flight path that Peter would have taken, yet nothing could be found. Searchers and volunteers on foot were also searching the surrounding woodlands in hope of finding the missing pilot. Over 200 people were involved in this search, and yet nothing could be found. No sign of smoke or any sign of possible wreckage. Even the military got involved and used sonar equipment to look for wreckage on the seafloor, and again, Nothing could be found. People who lived in the surrounding area were also questioned by police and asked if they heard anything that could have resembled a crash, and yet, even then, nobody heard anything. The status of Peter Gibbs would stay in this unknown state for an additional four months. In that span of time, there were daily searches by both those on foot and by plane. The entire area was searched, with the search radius extending up to 30 miles, and still, nothing could be found. Sonar was continually used, people were re-interviewed, and all seemed for nothing as no matter how hard anyone searched, it truly seemed Peter Gibbs had disappeared, and would never be found again. However, that was until early April, when a local shepherd named Donald McKinnon came across a fallen tree near the hotel that Peter Gibbs departed from all those months ago. As Donald got closer, he noticed something lying across the tree, and once he realized what he was staring at, he quickly fled to alert authorities. And that was because Donald McKinnon had just discovered the body of Peter Gibbs. Upon discovering the body of Peter Gibbs, police, the locals, and Felicity were in complete shock. Not so much at the fact that he was deceased. It had been four months after all, so most had assumed that he perished in a wreck at sea. They were all shocked that he was here, less than a mile from the hotel, that the very investigation began all those months ago. The area that Peter was discovered was heavily wooded and hilly, yes, but it had been searched countless times by more than 200 people at some points, and yet nobody ever saw his body. This in and of itself was extremely bizarre, but what was even more shocking was that his body seemingly had no signs of trauma or injury. By this point, he was decomposing, yes, but just from a glance, there was no obvious cause of his demise. 
The next thing people wondered was, where was the plane? The area was heavily searched in the days after Peter's discovery, and yet nothing could be found. Rivers, lakes, locks, and even the sound of mole were all searched and still, no wreckage could be found. Divers were sent to search the area and still came up short. What also troubled police was that at the location of Peter's body, there was no sign of any damage to the ground or surrounding area. No trees, other than the one Peter was found on, were knocked over. No signs of previous fires could be found, and it was as if Peter simply walked over to the fallen tree, laid on top of it, and died. An autopsy was performed on Peter Gibbs, and while police waited for the results, they examined the photographs taken of Peter's body. He was found to be fully clothed, with no sign of damage to the clothing. Again, no sign of trauma was found on his body, and even when police went back to examine the scene, they could find no tracks even leading to the location. Granted, it had been snowing the night of his disappearance, and four months had passed, but what was also brought up was that if he had in fact been there the entire time and simply had just been missed by over 200 people searching the area, then how was it that no wildlife found him? For four months, his body seemingly laid there and there were no signs of any bite or scratch marks on his clothes or his body. This began to make police wonder if he had been placed there recently to make it look like he simply did die of natural causes. And when the autopsy reports came back, that idea grew even stronger. Once the results were in, police were again shocked to learn that no traces of seawater or any marine organisms were found on his body or clothes. Even after four months of being exposed to the elements, there would still have been some trace evidence of seawater at the very least on his body. And yet, nothing was there. So the idea that he simply wrecked his plane in the ocean and was able to get out and swim to shore was dismissed. And if that is the case, then where could the plane possibly be? Additional information came from the toxicology reports. When the results came in that no traces of alcohol, drugs, or poisons were found in his body. And while I found no article mentioning what I am about to say, that report alone is either inaccurate or there could be a strong possibility that Peter did not die on the night of his flight. The toxicology report stated that no alcohol was found in his body, yet it was said that the night of his flight, when he was having dinner with Felicity, that both of them were drinking wine, and on top of that, Peter had a shot of whiskey. This could change the entire nature of this mystery. Doing some simple research, I found that alcohol can stay in the blood for 6 hours, on the breath for 24 hours, in urine for up to 72 hours, and on hair for up to 90 days. While this clearly means that he couldn't have been alive for 90 days due to the stages of his decomposition, it could be that he was alive for several days after his flight. The toxicology report did state that he had been dead for at least 4 months. There could have been a few days time where Peter was alive, but even if that were the case, then why didn't he simply go back to the hotel on foot? Clearly, there was nothing really wrong with him. He had no broken bones or serious injury, and he was less than a mile away from the hotel. Why simply lay over and die of exposure instead of making the walk back? All of these questions made the mystery even more confusing. Many thought that with the discovery of Peter's body that surely a theory could be created that could explain what happened. And seemingly as quickly as this new discovery into the case happened, it quickly diminished too. It now seemed that they would not be able to know definitively what happened unless they found the plane. And with even more searches taking place by now, and yet still no sign of any wreckage could be found. The hope of this mystery ever being solved seemed to dim with each passing day. And this mystery would stay in this state for another 11 years. In September of 1986, 
two fishermen discovered a red and white aircraft about half a kilometer from the coast of Oban. Divers were sent to the location and claimed that the plane was a Cessna and had the registration of G-AVTN, the same one that the plane Peter Gibbs was flying. The report on the plane described that there was massive damage to the aircraft, appearing as if there was a tremendous impact with the water. Both of the wings and landing gear had been completely torn off, and there was a massive hole in the windshield and the engine itself was missing. As the search of the plane continued, it was discovered that the doors were still locked from the inside. Thus, the only means of escape would be the human-sized hole in the windshield. But if that had been Peter's plane, then there would have been no way he would have even made it to land. The impact alone would have killed him, if not knocked him unconscious, where he would have ultimately drowned. The plane was found 100 feet below the water's surface, and when you take that into consideration, then there is simply no way Peter would have managed to be ejected from a plane's windshield that was powerful enough to rip the engine out and then survive that, swim for an unspecified distance, and then make it to land taking into consideration that the autopsy report showed no signs of salt water on him, and it leads to one of two things. Either this was the plane Peter was flying and someone else crashed it, or this was the wrong aircraft. And if that was the fact, then why did the registration match? There were attempts at recovering the wreckage, but none were successful and the photographs taken of the craft were in such poor condition that nothing could be distinguished. As it goes with most mysteries, the lack of any actual answers soon create countless theories to fill in the blanks. Some theories being more believable and credible, and others being more outlandish to say the least. I am not going to go over all of them due to the fact that there are so many, but some have stood out as being likely, yet most all of them have at least a few holes that can't be ignored. One of the more popular theories was that Peter Gibbs decided to make this flight his final one. The theory goes that Peter was unhappy with his life and decided that he would take his own way out by doing something that he loved doing, flying. People credit this due to him having a nice dinner and drinking the night of the flight. The fact that he refused to hear anybody's warnings that it was dangerous to fly in such poor conditions. The fact that he wanted Felicity to help guide him out, almost as a way of her saying goodbye, in a way only they would understand. And the most important is the fact that he was stated to have sat in his plane longer than usual while it was idling. People theorize that he was making peace with himself and knew that this was going to be the final time he ever flew. It also goes along with why he had Felicity be the only one to use a flashlight. Some think that he knew there would be no chance of him being able to see a single light while flying in such poor conditions and did so so that he couldn't change his mind and fly back essentially forcing himself to go through with his plan. It goes even further, with people saying that he actually decided last minute to cancel the plan and abort, leaping from the aircraft with a parachute and landing safely. But instead of going back, he decided to go back to his original plan, and instead of it being a violent end, he decided to lay down in the woods and let exposure take him as he slept. Now... The obvious holes here are that if he did in fact parachute, then where was it? No parachute was ever found, and I doubt that he took the time to hide it so well that nobody could ever find it. Keep in mind it was dark, freezing cold, and snowing on top of that, so why even bother hiding it? The other fact that doesn't make sense here is when the plane that many think was the one Peter was flying was found 11 years later, the doors had been locked from the inside. So how would he have even gotten out of the plane? And I highly doubt Peter decided to just kick a hole in the windshield and then jump out with a parachute. The main reason this theory is so popular 
is due to Felicity's seeming lack of involvement. There wasn't much reported on her after this, and some speculate that it was due to her knowing what Peter's idea was the entire time. Another theory was Peter was murdered during the flight and someone was hiding in the plane when it occurred. That would explain the delayed time the plane spent idling. There was also a report that there was a second set of lights that were seen along with Felicity's flashlight, and that this second light could have been used by the person responsible for the crime. Yet, there is no evidence supporting this at all. Granted, a theory doesn't need evidence, but I feel this is more in the realm of people trying to make something stick. For example, if someone was on the plane and attacking Peter, then true, perhaps the sound of a struggle would not be heard over the sound of the plane's engine. Yet, how would someone have known Peter was even going to fly that night? And how did they know he was going to fly alone? How did they know he wouldn't have been armed? And what would they even have done with the body once finished? On top of that, you have to remember that Peter's body showed no signs of trauma or poison. So that seemingly rules out the murder theory completely. One final theory is that Peter was part of an illegal armed smuggling ring, and the reason for the spontaneous night flight was due to him needing to make a delivery. People argue that that was why he was so adamant about flying that night, even when the conditions were horrible. He knew that he didn't have a choice. That could also explain why Felicity was the only one with a flashlight, since she knew what he was doing, and he wouldn't have to trust a stranger and risk having them tell someone. This theory also goes on that Peter could have been late or even missed the delivery time altogether and was then silenced for his actions. Those responsible could have waited for a while until the heat from the police died down and then dump Peter's body, and that would explain why nobody found him until months later in an area that had been heavily searched. But again, while I can see parts of this fitting, it seemingly gets ruled out simply due to the autopsy report on Peter. And on top of that, why destroy the plane? To make it look like an accident? If that was the intended goal, then why not simply leave his body in the water so it would look like a simple accident? Why hide him extremely close to the hotel that he was staying at? Was the point of destroying the plane to remove any type of evidence? And as a matter of fact, was the plane that was discovered 11 years later even the same plane to begin with? And if not, then where is it? Ultimately, it has been over four decades since Peter Gibbs took his final flight and would create one of the most bizarre mysteries in aviation history. It seems that no matter what possible answer you throw at this case, there is at least one thing standing in the way making it impossible. The level of frustration that surrounds this entire story is equaled only by the level of intrigue in it. How can a man manage to have an entire aircraft disappear and then be found four months later, with no evidence to where the plane is or what happened to him. The cause of death given to Peter Gibbs officially was exposure, and given the harsh conditions of the night of his flight, it would make sense that he met with that fate. But even then, how could no one have found his body any sooner? Why did no wildlife disturb the body? Why was there no alcohol found in his system, yet he was confirmed to be drinking an hour before the flight? Was the plane that was discovered 11 years later even the same one Peter was piloting? Numerous investigations by police, and even locals, have produced little answers, and even after all of these years, debates by both experts and theorists continue on. It appears that much like the snowy night Peter Gibbs took his final flight, this case will remain blanketed in mystery. <laughs>